to Mike and the New Colts team here for organizing such an inspiring and wonderful event. I'm uh, really honored and excited to be a part of it and share some of my uh, ongoing development around aesthetics and particularly music therapy in arts-based research. So to go back to what our keynote asked us to consider, I have my notes here, but um, there's lots of them. <laughs> So why is it that we don't use art in art-based work? And I, I have ideas about that. And it's really, you know, where I'm thinking is, you know, we are trying to fit into a mold that really does not um, speak to or express the work that we do indigenously. Um, so trying to get a voice in that major paradigm and the dominant norm in society, particularly in Western, um, culture is very difficult and so I think we've just especially in music therapy we've in this country we've aligned ourselves with a paradigm and a dominant norm which is absolutely fine but it's not capturing everything that we do so that's that's my response to that particular question and then how how do we do it so I'm gonna move into the next really talk about um, you know how important method is in in when we research so when we move into a systemized um, way of finding truth and finding knowledge artistically um, I think I'd go back to method and um, bringing in the idea of culture and how we play big roles in society and so critical social aesthetics is, um, is a developing approach and developing idea um, and method around how we are and what we bring and expressing our intersectionality, um, who we are in different roles, as Lisa was pertaining to, in, um, in what we do. Can everybody still hear me? So I'm, my work is grounded in a social and cultural context of anxiety. Um, so clinically my work is around anxiety and I'm also particularly interested in the interpersonal roots of anxiety. So the relational um, piece of what anxiety means for us and in the larger scale, the macro scale, about how that um, changes and how that impacts culture in society. And so acknowledging difference with compassion is something that I hold dear and is a root of my philosophical inquiry. Because um, when you look at the definition of compassion, it actually talks about how we are co-suffering in our human spirits together, in our, in our human experience. And so, um, as we've heard from our speakers so far, we're really interested in getting to that root of the interpersonal, the reciprocal, um, the relational side of what it is that makes us all, makes the world go round and changes the world. Um, so it's an inclusive philosophy. Um, what do I mean by inclusiveness? You know, when we think about our intersectionalities, we think about our ethnicity, we think about our gender, we think about our immigration status, we think about socio socioeconomic status, um, other areas of life that we bring in. We are not just linear... Um, beings. We have lots and lots of different roles. And so in clinical practice, as in my applied arts-based work, um, I think about this in my own reflexive practice and what I'm bringing into not just the room as a participant researcher, as a clinician, but also um, how that impacts the music that I create in, that's co-created in the improvisational space, in the environment. And so that's really where I'm coming from um, in my critical social aesthetics work. And so critical social aesthetics uh, approach is really based around critical social theory as defined as the application of knowledge in order to liberate humans from the circumstances that cause disempowerment. And so I really responded to what Lisa was talking about in terms of... Um, how we manage ourselves and how we work in art form uh, 
from an, you know, I, I responded thinking as an empowered being, coming into this, um, working indigenously with our art form, with our craft, um, from an empowered stance, something that um, is parallel to that that I, that I write about is helping us as researchers and clinicians um, empower ourselves and also empower communities uh, from a social justice perspective. So, the social and cultural context of anxiety, the interpersonal roots of anxiety, something that I'm um, invested in is what I call the social architecture of anxiety. What makes up these, um, these phenomenon that we see um, in culture um, through uh, our identity with difference. And unfortunately, difference is something that has been used against people and cultures. And um, I'm trying to bring that open, bust it open, and say, right, this is where we've got to come into um, critically as researchers in the arts and acknowledge our intersectionality and acknowledge that difference is vibrant and difference is important to, uh, to work around. Okay, so aesthetics. I understand aesthetics as um, a key and root factor and concept in improvisation-based work. And this doesn't just talk about, you know, it's not about music therapy, it's about art with a capital A. Um, what Sean was describing earlier, what Lisa was describing, is a form of improvisation. <coughs> we co-create the craft, we co-create the data. And I know Sean doesn't like to say data, but I do. <laughs> so we co-create that from the research context. And so moving this dialogue forward, um, I'm interested to see how we, how we inform one another in our specialties from our disciplinary knowledge to find an interdisciplinarity and a creative epistemology. So um, a couple of guys that I'm really, really into at the moment in aesthetics uh, is uh, contemporary psychological aesthetics. And typically that's not really an area that um, music therapy particularly has gravitated to. Um, not even the world of aesthetics really has because it, they come with their own thing in psychological aesthetics. But um, Roald and Copper are really contemporary in their idea of um, really taking apart this um, traditional way of looking at aesthetics um, from feeling and reason. Uh, you know, it's about how we sense and perceive music, how we sense and perceive art. That's how I understand aesthetics, that's how we talk about music aesthetics. I mean, psychological aesthetics, um, this is what they're saying. Instead of accepting such a dichotomy of between feeling and reason, one could assume that there are variations of knowledge connected to different psychic functions. That can be used to debate the common perceptual way of interacting with the world, and it also implies that the established perception, sensing and effective life is normatively founded, that is, something into which one is socialized. And so for me, this really leans towards my philosophical perspective on how um, I feel a responsibility to uh, address difference and the presence of difference in my intersectionality in our in relational space within improvisation as a generation of data in arts-based work. Okay, so aesthetics and social transformation. You know, how, how we sense and how we perceive the cultural relational environment in improvisation. Um, so for the most part, uh, improvisation in music therapy is taught from a technical perspective, right? Clinical musicianship, and, you know, we, um, there's lots of implied othering practices that um, traditionally we've been taught improvisation about idioms and modes. And I'm interested in taking that a step further and developing our discourse and conversation and theory into um, something that acknowledges our cultural relational space and that the, con the experience of consciousness changes the way in which we um, create the musical and the artistic discourse in that shared relational space. And that currently, um, we may not be looking at reflexivity as an action-based tool 
as in our roles as therapists and researchers. And you'll hear I talk about my role as a therapist, um, clinician, as well as a researcher, because my research is applied work. I'm a pragmatist, I do work around different paradigms, um, but I'm always coming back to improvisation and anxiety, and um, how I can make change and help change um, through that process. Okay, so this construct that I'm uh, developing and presenting to you today, and I really um, hope for dialogue and discussion and please question and critique because it's developing and I really want to um, have a conversation about, about it. Uh, so it's called Clinical Listening, Cultural Listening. And so what, um, what we do in this, it has four major areas. And so in critical social aesthetics, the four major areas are reflexivity, intention, perspectives of listening, and the social cultural projections, such as the music metaphor system by Roger Scruton um, that I've applied in this work. So I use operational tools and metaphor as in, within aesthetics as a major implication to help me identify some discourse and improvisation. Okay, so this is what the model looks like. So we have cultural listening and we have clinical listening. And in the middle is a mix, an active ingredients mix of the multiple perspectives of listening that's influenced from Colin Lee's work, um, intention, reflexivity, and the music metaphor system from the aesthetics. Okay, so I'm going to introduce to you how I operationalize all of this. Um, I'm going to actually go back to this a uh, second. Ooh, hang on. Where are we going here? Ooh, that one. Okay. All right. And so clinical listening, in its detail, uses a set of ways of listening, um, from listening to the open environment, listening to uh, your own biases and your responses, listening to and using empathy to think about how the participant is responding and how that is impacted by your own biases. So all these different levels of listening, listening to the musical content, the artistic content. So lots of holistic, it's a holistic way of listening. And then cultural listening. Remember when I talked about the intersectionalities that we all bring into the space, the research space. So really thinking about, you know, who, what am I bringing in and what is currently on my radar at this point? Um, how am I responding to the participants? Uh, how am I responding to the topic that, I'm, that I am investigating? And so merging that together using these four ways. So the listening and intention. When I say intention, it's using, it's using the experience of consciousness. And I don't say conscious, unconscious. It's the experience of consciousness. Bringing in yourself with a capital S. Yes, bringing in your... Um, bringing in yourself into this as the researcher. And so bringing in your reflexivity, understanding that you are part of this process and that you are the agent in this process and taking responsibility for that from your cultural and from your clinical perspective. And then the music metaphor system So the music metaphor system uses a series of um, aesthetic operational tools. So the music metaphor. So the music metaphor is when we intentionally use the sound that we make. Um, the example I'm going to give is sounds from vocal psychotherapy techniques in a group setting um, in the pre-pilot. So activating perceptions using the vocal or instrumental sounds to um, enter into what you almost say the journey. So this is how um, I use the aesthetic tools to bring, uh, bring everybody, researcher, participant, researcher, participants, into the creative journey, into the space, to go deeper into finding truth, finding knowledge about whatever the topic is that um, we're describing and want to seek. 
In this particular example that I'm going to share with you, it was with a social justice women's rights chorus who were, um, it was exploring um, children, girls' rights to be educated. And so uh, what we were doing is exploring this from how arts-based processes between music, and I had an art therapy colleague, Dr. Susan Firestone, work with me in this uh, particular project, and how does this kind of method of critical social aesthetics, using these tools, using the, this method, um, affect and impact the aesthetic quality and generate quality data in order for it, the chorus, to sing about um, this particular topic from the particular piece that they were practicing from a more authentic, reflexive place. And the music that was co-created, um, how that would impact bringing it back into the actual pre-composed piece. Um, so it would be more authentic in the next performance. And so working with the music metaphor in that system, um, so was in this case working with um, toning and vocalizing um, in the group. Okay, so music metaphor is part of the metaphor system. And then once that emerges, and it's very hard to describe until you, until you listen to uh, art data, right, or see art data, um, it's very hard to describe it, but it's the process. Once, once the deepening and once the journey had begun, then you know, motifs and music metaphors emerge. And then once the music metaphor emerges, that activates the perceptions, the intentional perceptions, the cultural relational space of what the women, all women chorus, was feeling, sensing, and perceiving aesthetically, um, emotionally, cognitively, holistically, on, the, on their experiences of the topic of girls' rights to be educated. Okay, so the perception, once the perceptions start moving in there, then I'm able to go into um, working with what's called the musical object. So Roger Scruton describes mu the musical object in that it, um, com it moves and it, it is created from when the listener is listening to um, traditionally a classical piece of music. In this context, I use the musical object as um, when we transition maybe from sounds to words and from free associative singing. And so when that comes up, um, I'm able to just take the experience for the women from just sounds into them owning their own experience about girls' rights to be educated. Um, what they think in terms of when they sing at, about the topic, when they sing to the topic, and potentially when they sing as the topic. Or as, um, in this particular case, there was uh, certain roles. So that's activating a whole, what's called an image schemata system. And I know it sounds really techy, and I can get a little bit nerdy around aesthetic technology um, tools. But those are the three main areas of the music metaphor system. And then, you know, we can go into a little bit more detail with that little um, later on in conversation if we choose to. Um, so I'm, so that's the image schemata system. So it's an active relational space of how the musical metaphor comes up and is from the consciousness of the group and then it moves into becoming a musical object which then is in turn um, accessed through certain um, clinical, if you can, you know, techniques, I've used clinical techniques and I apply them into um, research into the data collection phase. Okay. All right. So hopefully we've got cue music. So I'm uh, just going to a quick context. So what you're going to what you're going to hear is several excerpts from that group that I mentioned, and um, it's going to I'll just briefly describe Mike and then we can start it. So there was a vocal holding exercise after I had the women read through, this is um, partial of the text of the pre-written piece by the director of the chorus, uh, Sandy Hammond, and this was about the story of Malala Yousafzai, who was um, shot by the Taliban, 
and she received the Nobel Peace Prize um, several years ago now, in 2015, last year, in 2015. And so um, this social justice chorus was working on her story and the overall topic of uh, girls' rights to be educated, um, and a big global issue um, that women and children, girls are facing. And so it's very dramatic, it's very um, provocative when we just read through that. And so um, in narrative inquiry, there's a method uh, that we use where we have the group members read out a sentence from the pre-written narrative. And so as a way of warming up the group, just verbally, I had each member go through each sentence, and we did that several times, and then I moved into uh, artistic expression of their response, response to that. So again, I'm just going to highlight the journey. We moved through the journey, and this was a way of going from step by step into a deeper place and getting to the material. Okay. And so what you're going to hear, I'll keep it on that, what I'm describing. So the music, after they did some vocalizing, then the music metaphor emerged, which in this case was the intentional use of the sound to activate perception towards Malala and the topic of girls' rights to be educated. And then listening to that sound in that context provided room for any individual or collective anxiety about this topic to be explored as music. Once the vocal holding had time to evolve, Free associative singing was introduced, and all members could participate and contribute to a vocal narrative about the topic. So now harnessing the skills of reflexivity and intention. And so the musical object that emerged, and the group moved into a singing to Malala. So oppressed and empowered relationships. And then to the Taliban, the oppressor. The phrase that emerged, which the group used as its social cultural projection, was get away from me, oh get away from me. So it sounded like get away from me, oh get away from me. And then a whole rich context and color of chords came out that is not part of the pre-composed music. So this was this was the group really harnessing the the um, cultural relational space musically and aesthetically to um, create the sounds that really reflected how they um, responded to the depth of this topic from their intersectionality and their experiences as women who walked in the world. Okay. So the group moved into um, singing as an empowered voice to the oppressor with the initial phrase, I have a scent of my own and we use objects um, the, from the art therapist uh, colleague, we use art objects such as um, little um, rubbery insects through to soft furry objects through to some scents. So that stimulated these responses that way. So the multisensory environment um, was activated and moving through at this point. And so um, after they had sung that, they were also moving into saying, phrase, singing phrases, I am beautiful, I am strong, I am unending, which I found fascinating. This was a springboard for the vocalist to explore the complex social issues of girls' rights to be educated intentionally and reflexively in the art journey. It also provided a shared experience where they could resource and empower one another and in, uh, we're in the process of uh, analyzing more of this uh, data, but the concept and the relationship to group experience was something that is coming up a lot in this. Okay, so now we're going to listen to just several uh, excerpts of their journey through this.
So just to um, come back to how do we evaluate arts-based research, art-based research, um, I do believe that if we can try to develop our methods and methodology of finding ways to at least frame the work that we do, but also allow for the liberty of the freedom of the expression of um, the craft and the magic of what it is that we do, I, I think that we could push our, our discourse within expressive therapies within the whole paradigm of creative arts. Um, to uh, a new level. And so here's my suggestion to, uh, to develop an, an ongoing idea for that and in critical social aesthetics to uh, think about um, when you're thinking about the question, think about your aesthetic position as it is informed by culturally conditioned intentions. And then when you're in designing and evaluating the research design, consider including the aesthetic theoretical process and potential impact of clinical listening and cultural listening as part of the method. And then when generating the data, consider the clinical listening, cultural listening uh, approach as a method to use within the music improvisation and the artistic process, whatever modality. And then when performing or analyzing or disseminating results, consider the clinical cultural listening as a mechanism that requires intention and reflexivity within the aesthetic environment to extract the musical material. And with that, I will finish. <laughs>